you're probably thinking of um, quantum physics and relativity. Mm-hmm. And the reason those don't mesh is that quantum physics, the the name quanta is like little things. So mm-hmm. it's not little things like like your phone. It's little things like you will never be able to see them. They're so small. Atoms, electrons, um, quarks, subatomic particles. So that's this is the physics. And when I say physics, you ask like, what is physics? Really? It's like a beautiful language about, um, about how those things interact and how they work. And if you give them a little flick, where does it go? What happens to it? And with quantum physics, the rules of flicking a little particle and seeing where it goes are so wonky that you will, you won't know where that particle goes. It might tunnel through a barrier. It might, yeah, it might like, like as if this, you know, the plant on your wall could just move through the wall all of a sudden. Those types of things happen on the quantum scale. So weird things happen and you need special math to describe those weird behaviors. So that's quantum physics. And then over here is the opposite. So it's the opposite of like something really tiny would be something really, really big, something big enough to noticeably affect this, the curvature of space and time. Those are things like black holes, the sun, neutron stars, supernovas, like the most massive things in the universe are described by the language of general relativity. And we still have not been able to unify those. There's some places where the languages don't match is as if you, you translate them and the words don't mean the same thing. So, but mathematically. So, (laughs) so that would be like in one place you get a zero on in these equations, another place you get an infinity in these equations. And you're like, um, well, which one's right. And Mm. the truth is that we don't know in the small cases, quantum theory seems to be very right based on all of our experiments. And in the big cases, the relativity seems to be right based on all of our experiments and observations. And, and, uh, we're still looking for that math that can bridge the gap. I don't know if you experience the same, I I mean, this isn't scientific, but it's kind of explaining this sort of uh, curiosity is that I've explored kind of the nature of empathy and there are different kinds of empaths. And one of the forms of empathy, empaths they just want to know how and why so it seems uh, a little colder or a little bit um, less emotionally connected to start asking questions but that's the nature of that empathy is like I want to understand yeah yeah Um, absolutely so I don't meet I don't like feel someone's emotions but I kind of am aware of how they feel and then I want to understand why and so, I feel like you sound like the version of me that I'm always trying to convince people that that I'm I'm not, but I really am because they already put me in this box. They're like, you're a scientist. You must like when someone's upset or something and I'm asking questions and I want to understand, they're like, oh, you like you must just think logically and you're not there. And I'm like, no, I really want to know what's going on because I want to be able to. I want to be able to like imagine, okay, if I went through this, like A and then B, and then I did C, and then someone told me D, then I, I would feel this way and I can understand, like get to the yeah. place where they're, they're at. And it's like a, a version of, of empathizing with them on a deeper level. Any way of finding a way to be curious is that you can connect with other people. You keep asking questions. Eventually it'll lead you to asking questions about other humans and what they're interested in and what they love. And I think it's just a, I don't know. I don't think this is how most people think of science, but I think of it as another incredible way to connect with other humans, but through a slightly different lens. Yeah. High five. I agree. (laughs) I really agree. Um, Which is why I would love to to do the physics of with racing. um, of racing because it's not yeah. it's not something I know anything about, but but looking at it through a physics oh, lens. A lot. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. There's a million engineers and oh yeah. Yeah. Tunnels underneath the car that create yeah. like a vacuum to the ground. And did you ever get in any of that? Like were you ever in any of the, the experiments? No, I just would tell them how it felt. They'd been making okay. okay. I'd go out and I'd be like, oh my gosh, they might they might lower the end plate skirts on the wing a quarter uh, an eighth of an inch on both sides and I was like holy crap there the whole car is so much more grip now oh, I wow. can you know the front turns so much better I oh yeah it, 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 the minuscule minuscule differences with attitude of the car and ride mm-hmm. height of the car 
I mean, I had a one time they pulled like an, a 16th of an inch of shim. It's called in the front that lowers it a 16th of an inch on a stock yeah. car, which is a big car. Uh-huh. And I was like, and they actually, they added, no, no, no. They added a 32nd. It was either 32nd or 16th. It was so minuscule. And but I was like, you'd never be able to see it with your eyes. It was, it, it was no, so- I was like, you destroyed the car. I was like, it's terrible. Go back. Wow. Like it's so crazy how, um, it littlest things make a difference. And um, they're just experimenting with you as, as the, the guinea pig. I love that there's these engineers and they're like, well, oh, yeah. you know, obviously we have to put a driver who knows what she's doing in the yeah. seat and yeah. get it going. Yeah. And then that's the real feedback. Yeah. I I've, I've so many times, of course, thought of like dark matter, dark energy. Mm-hmm. I, I use the parallel of uh, junk DNA. Like we kind of don't understand like 95% of our DNA, oh, yeah. but we also don't yeah. understand like 95% of the universe. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, exactly. I'm also fascinated with fractals. Like I, I mm-hmm. will talk about that in a second, but, um, but I think about that a lot and I'm just, I wonder of the micro macro of, 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 of things. And if it's just some kind of fractal loop, but what is your understanding of dark matter or even your opinion at this point in time? Well, as a, like a little background to anyone who's never heard of dark matter, the way that I first learned about it is that one thing it does is that if you look at a, a galaxy and you look at how stars are moving around the galaxy, they should only be able to move so fast that the gravity inside the galaxy can hold them going that fast. And if, if something goes faster and I get in a galaxy, it'll fly off. Just like, imagine you're holding somebody's hand on the playground and you start spinning faster and faster. And then you, you like your sweaty hands lose grip and you can't hold on. It's the same in a galaxy where something going faster and faster around the center needs a certain amount of mass to hold on. So we look at a galaxy and we see how much matter is there. We're like, I can see a lot of brightness. So there's 5 billion stars, whatever. And then you calculate or you measure how fast those stars are moving. You calculate how fast they should be moving. And you find that many of the stars in the universe are moving way faster than they should be based off of how much matter is there to hold, you know, basically the the hands on the playground. Like, so the so so it doesn't make sense is what you're saying when we when you look out and you do the you do the math on what you're seeing in the universe and how much um how much mass there is based on the mass and then how fast things are moving they yeah. shouldn't be able to stay in orbit to that sun anymore. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. So they shouldn't be able to stay they they should be flying off into space but they're not. They're staying in orbit. So, and sometimes there's like, you know, a hundred times too little mass to hold on to these stars. So it's significant. It's not like, oh, we found 99.9% of the mass. We're like, where's the rest? No, it's like we found we we found one percent of the mass in some cases. Like these galaxies are way too small based on what we see. And so mm-hmm. the theory we've come up with is that there's extra matter there that we cannot see. And we've called it dark matter. So there's extra stuff there. And so, you know, the astute, curious person would be like, well, could it just be our math is wrong? Or could it be like something else is there that we're not seeing? Like maybe dead planets that aren't emitting a lot of light. But we have a bunch of other experiments that show us the same exact thing. We see light curving around galaxies and it curves too much. Can we see the black holes? Like, do we, if, especially if light's bending, is that a black hole? And is the black hole what creates more mass? Because they're supposed Sometimes. to everything up, apparently. Yeah. I mean, did you see a couple of years ago, the first image ever of a black hole oh, yeah. came out? Yeah. yeah, that was, yeah. I mean, that was very exciting for the science community. Oh, it was um, very exciting for the layman too. <laughs> because we've never, we've never seen it. I mean, that's, I think like when something is visible and you can like put an image to it to like really wrap your imagination around, it starts to become like the questions just yeah. start yeah. exploding in your mind. So, so what you're seeing there is not actually the black hole. You're seeing light bending around it. So yes. Around a black, a black hole. hole. So yeah. That could be something that's in these galaxies that is not bright, essentially. Right. Or, or the entire, out. or yeah, exactly. So, so we, it could be a bunch of little black holes. That's one theory. 